Welcome back to Counting to Five, a podcast about the United States Supreme Court. In this episode, we continue our preview of the upcoming 2017 term, looking at a case about the enforceability of arbitration agreements that will be argued in the first week of October. But before I dig into the case, I have a special announcement. This Friday, September 29th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, Counting to Five will be streaming live on YouTube with an interactive Supreme Court preview. Please stay tuned at the end of the episode for more details or check the show notes at CountingTo5.com. Now on with the episode. The case we're going to look at in this episode is the very first oral argument of the new October 2017 term, and it's actually three separate cases that have been consolidated for a single argument at the Supreme Court. Epic Systems v. Lewis, Ernst & Young LLP v. Morris, and NLRB v. Murphy Oil USA. For simplicity, I'll refer to the cases collectively as Epic Systems. Although the specific allegations in these cases differ, each involves claims against a business by its employees for violations of state or federal wage and hours laws. The issue before the Supreme Court, however, is not the wage and hours claims themselves, but whether these cases can stay in court at all. In each case, the employees tried to bring a collective action under the Fair Labor Standards Act, or FLSA, a federal statute that, among other things, sets federal minimum wage and overtime requirements. In two of the cases, they also sought to bring a class action for their state law wage and hour claims. A collective action is a special procedure under the FLSA that, like a class action, allows a plaintiff to sue on behalf of other similarly situated individuals. There are some significant differences between FLSA collective actions and standard class actions, but for purposes of this lawsuit, they can be treated as the same. In each case, the employees had signed an employment agreement that included an arbitration provision. That is, an agreement that any employment-related disputes would be resolved by a private arbitrator rather than in court. Crucially for this case, the agreements specified that arbitration must occur on an individual basis. That is, the employees waive the right to litigate or arbitrate as a collective or class action. The key question in this case is whether that class action waiver is enforceable. But first, let's step back and look at arbitration more generally. Arbitration is the resolution of a legal dispute by a private arbitrator instead of the courts. There are several often cited advantages to arbitration. First, Arbitration can be quicker and cheaper than litigation, which is sometimes prohibitively expensive. This is generally accomplished by streamlining procedural rules and severely limiting discovery, the ability to demand documents and information from the opposing party. Second, arbitrators are often experts in the particular subject matter of the dispute, unlike the generalist judges who hear most lawsuits. And third, arbitrations are usually confidential, while testimony and documents introduced in court is almost always public. It's easy to see why, for example, a real estate developer and a construction firm who find themselves at odds over the terms of a construction contract might want to arbitrate. They can get a quick resolution without the burden of collecting, reviewing, and producing tens or hundreds of thousands of pages of documents. They can avoid the reputational harms that might come from airing their dirty laundry in public. And their case can be decided by an arbitrator with decades of industry experience dealing with construction contracts and disputes, who's intimately familiar with industry terminology and standard business practices. In recent decades, however, arbitration agreements have become increasingly common not just in business-to-business -business contracts, but also in contracts between businesses and individuals. Consumer contracts like credit card agreements and cell phone contracts, and increasingly employment agreements, often contain arbitration provisions. Critics of arbitration argue that in these sorts of situations involving unsophisticated parties and unequal bargaining power, consumers and employees are severely disadvantaged. For example, the lack of extensive discovery may prevent individuals from gathering necessary evidence easily accessible to the corporation. Some also argue that arbitrators are systematically biased toward the corporate repeat players on whom they depend for future arbitration business. And, where there is also a class action waiver, damages may be too small to justify pursuing on an individual basis, so the arbitration agreement effectively cuts off all practical remedies. As a result, litigants have regularly challenged arbitration clauses in court and more than a few of these challenges have made it to the Supreme Court. But before we talk about the Supreme Court, we need to jump back almost a century to the passage of the Federal Arbitration Act. In 1925, in response to concerns that courts were not enforcing arbitration agreements, Congress enacted the Federal Arbitration Act, or FAA. The FAA was intended to ensure that arbitration agreements were enforceable in court and to prevent courts from second-guessing arbitrators' determinations by limiting the ability to challenge an arbitration award in court. A key provision of the FAA declares that agreements to arbitrate a dispute, quote, shall be valid, irrevocable, and enforceable, save upon such grounds as exist at law or in equity for the revocation of any contract. Over the years, the Supreme Court has decided a number of cases challenging arbitration agreements. These cases have addressed different legal issues, but in general, the court has been willing to enforce arbitration agreements broadly 
and has not been receptive to attempts to invoke the FAA's exception for grounds that exist for revocation of any contract. The court most recently addressed the FAA in a May 2017 decision in Kindred Nursing Centers v. Clark. Kindred Nursing Centers involved an arbitration agreement for claims by Kentucky nursing home residents signed by the residents' relatives exercising powers of attorney. The Kentucky Supreme Court held the arbitration agreements invalid, holding that under Kentucky law, a power of attorney does not authorize waiving fundamental constitutional rights, such as the right to a jury trial, unless such a waiver is explicitly authorized in the power of attorney. The Kentucky Supreme Court argued that this rule fit within the FAA's exception for such grounds as exist for the revocation of any contract because it did not single out arbitration, but applied instead to the waiver of any constitutional right. The U.S. Supreme Court disagreed, holding that, in fact, a state policy specifically protecting access to courts and right to trial by jury does disfavor arbitration in violation of the FAA. The court was unanimous with the exception of Justice Thomas, who holds the idiosyncratic position that the FAA doesn't apply in state court proceedings. But the court is not always so unified. In two other recent arbitration decisions, AT&T Mobility v. Concepcion in 2011 and American Express v. Italian Colors Restaurant in 2013, the court divided along stereotypical conservative liberal lines. Each case involved a challenge to an arbitration provision with a class action waiver, in one case arguing that the waiver was unconscionable under state contract law, and in the other that it violated federal antitrust law. In both cases, a conservative five-justice majority held that the arbitration provisions and class action waivers were enforceable under the FAA. The Epic Systems Consolidated cases present a new twist on challenges to class action waivers that the Supreme Court hasn't yet considered. It involves the interaction between the FAA and another federal statute, the National Labor Relations Act, or NLRA. The NLRA is the primary federal law protecting workers' rights to engage in collective bargaining and other concerted actions in the workplace. Most important for this case, the NLRA states that, quote, employees shall have the right to self-organization, to form, join, or assist labor organizations, to bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing, and to engage in other concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining or other mutual aid or protection. The NLRA goes on to say that any interference with these rights is an unfair labor practice. The employees here argue that bringing employment-related class actions is exactly the sort of concerted activity for the purposes of mutual aid or protection that the NLRA protects. If this is right, then the class action waivers are in violation of the NLRA and are therefore unenforceable. Significantly, in 2012, the National Labor Relations Board, or NLRB, that's the federal agency responsible for enforcing the NLRA, issued an administrative decision in which it explicitly adopted this interpretation of the NLRA, holding that class action waivers are unlawful and that illegality under the NLRA is a defense to contract enforcement. In a few minutes, we'll come back to the significance of that earlier NLRB decision, but there's more to say about the NLRB's role in this case. The NLRB is actually a party to one of the three consolidated cases, NLRB v. Murphy Oil USA. In that case, Sheila Hobson, an employee of Murphy Oil USA, filed an unfair labor practice charge against Murphy Oil with the NLRB, specifically challenging the class waiver provision of her employment agreement. The NLRB agreed with Hobson, declaring that requiring employees to resolve employment-related claims through individual arbitration was an unfair labor practice. Murphy Oil appealed the NLRB's decision to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which reversed finding the agreement enforceable. The NLRB then petitioned the Supreme Court to take the case. The United States Solicitor General's Office, which represents the interests of the federal government before the Supreme Court, filed the Supreme Court cert petition on behalf of the NLRB. That's the normal practice when a federal agency is asking for Supreme Court review, but here's where things get unusual. After the 2016 presidential election, the new administration reversed the Department of Justice's position on the class waiver issue in this case. Although the Solicitor General's office had been aligned with the employees and the NLRB, it now sided with the employers. The NLRB is an independent agency, somewhat insulated from the presidential administration, and, unlike many other agencies, it has the statutory authority to independently litigate before the Supreme Court. So following the administration's change in position, the NLRB took over its own representation at the Supreme Court, and the Solicitor General filed an amicus brief, that's a brief by a non-party to the case, in support of the employers. So this leaves us with a very unusual situation where the Solicitor General has filed briefs on both sides of the same case, and currently two federal agencies, the NLRB and the Department of Justice, are facing off against each other, and indeed, attorneys from both the NLRB and the Solicitor General's office will be participating in oral argument on October 2nd. 
But back to the legal question. The basic issue before the court is how to reconcile these two federal statutes. According to the employers and the Trump administration, the federal policy favoring arbitration wins out. The FAA clearly and unequivocally requires the enforcement of arbitration agreements. The NLRA, on the other hand, doesn't explicitly protect the right to bring class litigation, but speaks only of concerted activities. Under this view, these two statutes can best be reconciled by interpreting the NLRA to not apply to class litigation, thereby eliminating any conflict with the FAA. On the other hand, the employees and the NLRB argue that the supposed conflict between these two statutes is illusory. The FAA contains an explicit exception allowing the invalidation of agreements on grounds that would be applicable to any contract. Contracts whose terms violate federal statutes are generally invalid, and the class waiver provisions of arbitration agreements violate the NLRA. According to the employers, this is yet another example of the kind of evasion the Supreme Court has repeatedly rejected in the past. The employees frame their position broadly in terms of the violation of federal statutes, but, the employers argue, this is really about an interpretation of the NLRA that specifically targets arbitration. But, the employees respond, it's not the arbitration requirement that makes these provisions violate the NLRA, but the class action waiver. Employers are free to require individual claims to be arbitrated rather than litigated. They just can't foreclose avenues for collective or class relief. And this highlights a question that pervades this case. Is this really a case about arbitration or class actions? When employers include arbitration provisions with class waivers in their employment agreements, is it really because they prefer arbitration over the judicial system? Or is the real aim to cut off class actions and arbitration provisions are just a means to that end? But on the other hand, the primary purpose of arbitration is to reduce the burden of litigation through streamlined procedures that allow the quick and efficient resolution of claims. Class action litigation or class-wide arbitration is anything but streamlined and quick, and therefore, hostility to class action waivers is hostility to the very procedural simplicity that allows arbitration to be a cost-effective alternative. One final issue in this case that's worth noting is a legal doctrine known as Chevron deference, which takes its name from a 1984 Supreme Court case called Chevron USA v. Natural Resources Defense Council. Stated simply, Chevron deference is the principle that when a statute administered by a federal agency is unclear or ambiguous, courts must defer to that agency's reasonable interpretation of the statute. Although the Chevron doctrine is fairly deeply entrenched, it has prominent critics, notably including new Supreme Court Justice Neil Gorsuch, and the Supreme Court has often been divided over how the doctrine applies in particular cases. Here, the employees point to the NLRB's decisions interpreting the NLRA's protection of concerted action to include class action litigation. They argue that under Chevron, the court must defer to this interpretation and find the class action waivers invalid under the NLRA. The employers counter that the real issue is the interaction between the NLRA and the FAA, and specifically whether the invalidation of the class waivers fits within the FAA's exception. The NLRB is not responsible for administering the FAA, and therefore, the employers say, its interpretation deserves no deference under Chevron. As is common at the Supreme Court, advocates for the opposing parties have framed the legal issues in very different ways. It'll be interesting to see how the justices react to these competing characterizations at oral argument. And that brings us to the end of episode 16. As I mentioned at the top of the episode, this Friday, September 29th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, Counting to Five will be streaming live on YouTube. I'll be discussing each of the cases set for argument in the court's first week, I'll be previewing some of the most anticipated cases to be heard later this term, and, most importantly, I'll be answering viewer questions via YouTube live chat. If this live stream gets a good response, we may try to make this a regular feature, so if you can make it, please join me this Friday, September 29th, at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. A link to the live stream can be found in the show notes or on the Counting to Five YouTube page. In the next episode, we're going to revisit the Epic Systems arbitration cases with an interview with Max Folkenflik, an attorney representing the employees in Ernst & Young v. Morris, one of the three consolidated cases. Links to resources related to this episode can be found in the show notes at countingtofive.com. That's T-O and the number 5. You can leave comments and questions on the show notes post at countingtofive.com or on the Counting to 5 Facebook page, tweet at Counting to 5, or send an email to mike at countingtofive.com. You can call and leave questions and comments on the Counting to Five voicemail line at 774-226-8685. That's 774-2-COUNT-5. Your feedback is important to us. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to Counting to Five in your favorite podcast app, directory, or service 
to make sure you don't miss future episodes. Thank you for listening. This has been Counting to Five.